the President's press conference from the State Department Auditorium in Washington, D.C., July 24, 1964. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to announce the successful development of a major new strategic manned aircraft system which will be employed by the Strategic Air Command. This system employs the new SR-71 aircraft and provides a long-range advanced strategic reconnaissance plane for military use, capable of worldwide reconnaissance of military operations. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, when reviewing the RS-70, emphasized the importance of the strategic reconnaissance mission. The SR-71 aircraft reconnaissance system is the most advanced in the world. The aircraft will fly at more than three times the speed of sound. It will operate at altitudes in excess of 80,000 feet. It will use the most advanced observation equipment of all kinds in the world. The aircraft will provide the strategic forces of the United States with an outstanding long-range reconnaissance capability. The system will be used during periods of military hostilities and in other situations in which the United States military forces may be confronting foreign military forces. The SR-71 uses the same J-58 engine as the experimental interceptor previously announced, but it is substantially heavier and it has a longer range. The considerably heavier gross weight permits it to accommodate the multiple reconnaissance sensors needed by the Strategic Air Command to accomplish the strategic reconnaissance mission in a military environment. This billion dollar program was initiated in February 1963. The first operational aircraft will begin flight testing in early 1965, and deployment of production units to the Strategic Air Command will begin shortly thereafter. Appropriate members of Congress have been kept fully informed on the nature of and the progress in this aircraft program. Further information on this major advanced aircraft system will be released from time to time at the appropriate military secret classification levels. I'm pleased to announce today that in the year ending Ju July 30th, Amer American exports of farm products broke all records, reaching an all-time high of $6,151,000,000. This represents a 20% increase in farm exports in a single year, a billion dollars and a 35% gain over the levels of the year 1960. Once again, American agriculture has demonstrated its ability to succeed in highly competitive world markets. The trade surplus in agriculture last year was over $2 billion, the highest in 50 years. This represents a substantial contribution to the plus side of our balance of payments ledger. Farm exports contribute to the increased prosperity of our farm economy. The latest revised estimates from the Department of Agriculture show that net farm income in 1963 was $12,518,000,000, more than a quarter of a billion dollars higher than we had estimated six months ago. The net income per farm increased from $2,961 in 1960 to $3,504 in 1963, an increase in this period from 60 to 63 of more than 18 percent. I think I should comment briefly on a number of international problems. First, I think most Europeans know that the United States has never had any interest whatever in trying to dominate Europe or any other area in the world. On the contrary, the United States has constantly supported the strengthening of the free nations of Europe. We believe that Europe and the United States have great common interests, common purposes, and common obligations. So we have never supposed that any European country would need to choose between its ties to the United States and its ties to Europe. We believe that any effort to force such a choice would be bad for Europe, bad for the alliance, and I have found, uh, I might say, general agreement on this view in my talks with uh, Prime Minister Hume and Chancellor Earhart and President Senny and many other European leaders uh, who have been here this year. 
Second, I should like to call your attention to the excellent series of meetings which we have had in Washington this last week with the leaders of Australia and New Zealand and Malaysia. These meetings have allowed the United States to underscore its support for the freedom and independence of three most important Pacific states. And our friendship and understanding with these governments, I feel, has been greatly strengthened. Third, in the continuing discussion of Southeast Asia, let me state American policy once more. We are determined to support the freedom and the independence of South Vietnam, where Prime Minister Khan and Ambassador Taylor have established the closest understanding with each other. They are in continual consultation, and the policies of the two nations are the same, namely, to increase the effectiveness of the whole program in that country, political, social, economic, and military. It is true that there is danger and provocation from the North, and such provocation could force a response. But it is also true that the United States seeks no wider war. Other friends suggest that this problem must be moved to a conference table. And indeed, if others would keep the solemn agreements already signed at a conference table, there would be no problem in South Vietnam. If those who practice terror and ambush and murder will simply honor their existing agreements, there can easily be peace in Southeast Asia immediately. But we do not believe in a conference call to ratify terror, so our policy is unchanged. For 10 years, and in uh, three different administrations, the United States has been committed to the freedom and the independence of South Vietnam, helping others to help themselves. In those 10 years, we have taken whatever actions were necessary, sending men and supplies for different specific purposes at different times. We shall stick to that policy, and we shall continue our effort to make it even more effective. We shall do the same in our support for the legitimate government of Laos. Fourth, this week I have conferred with the foreign ministers of this hemisphere at the White House, and our eyes turn to Latin America. Down in Mexico, there has been a highly successful meeting of the Inter-American Committee on the Alliance for Progress. The foreign ministers are working here to meet a challenge to our peace and freedom. That meeting is still in session. So I must announce to you that I shall confine myself to the hope that in the spirit of the hemisphere, a sound, and I believe an effective answer, will be found. These four problems are not the only ones that we have to deal with in the world today. There are many, many others, such as dangers in Cyprus and disturbance in the Congo and difficulty in the Kennedy Round. But we still work for peace in Cyprus and the Congo and for progress in the Kennedy Round. We are a steadfast people in the United States, and in the larger sense, the world is less danger, and we are stronger than we were four years ago. So our work for peace must go on and will go on with success, I believe. I understand that we have with us today a group of journalists from Latin America who are here to cover the meeting of the foreign ministers, and I would want to extend to them a very cordial welcome, and now I'm ready to answer any questions you may have. How do you feel about the uh, statements that have come from various officials in New York City, including the mayor and the deputy mayor, to the general effect that there are indications of communist involvement in the recent racial violence in New York City? And have you received any such evidence that would back up such indications? I receive uh, detailed reports uh, at the close of each day uh, with regard to the investigations that have been carried on by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I do not care to comment in detail uh, on those reports until uh, some conclusions have been reached and some recommendations made, and until I think it's uh, more appropriate to do so, I would not hesitate to say that the impression I gain from reading those reports is that there are uh, uh, extremist elements involved, and uh, at the appropriate time, uh, uh, 
I think that uh, their identity will be made known. Mr. President, uh, would you comment on what you hope or what you feel might be accomplished with your meeting with Senator Goldwater this afternoon? Senator Goldwater, uh, through the facilities of his office, asked the legislative uh, representative of the White House for an opportunity to meet with the president and on an unpublicized basis, and we uh, informed uh, the White House representative that we would be glad to meet with Senator Goldwater. We met with uh, senators every day, and we would certainly be glad to meet with him any time that he thought a meeting would be useful. And that uh, the 5.30 arrangement today was uh, made. Uh, I cannot anticipate uh, all the subjects that will come up, but uh, I'm very glad to talk to him, and we'll try to be uh, uh, responsive and make the meeting as fruitful as possible. Mr. President, Mr. President uh, in elaboration of your statement on uh, South Vietnam, President de Gaulle yesterday called for France, Communist China, the Soviet Union, and the United States all to get out of Indochina and leave them to settle their problems themselves. Would you address yourself to that proposal, sir? I think that I have already done that. Uh, I pointed out that we had uh, already had one conference, and that we would carry out the agreements reached at that conference table, that uh, there would uh, be uh, uh, no need of our uh, presence there. But until uh, there is demonstrated upon the part of uh, those who are ignoring uh, the agreements reached at the conference table, uh, uh, some desire to carry out their agreement, uh, we expect to continue our efforts in Vietnam. Mr. President. Mr. President, after Senator Goldwater said last week that if he were president, uh, he would give at least the NATO commander more latitude in the utilization of nuclear weapons. The Republican Convention rejected a, an amendment to the platform restating the traditional civilian authority over the military. What is your reaction to these actions, and could you give us your philosophy of civilian-military relationships in this particular area of nuclear weapons? Well, I think there should be a complete understanding and confidence uh, in this country and among all of our friends abroad. The control of nuclear weapons uh, is one of the most solemn responsibilities of the President of the United States. The man who is president can never get away from that responsibility and can never forget it. The American people uh, rely on his good judgment. They want that authority vested in a civilian. Uh, that they do not expect to abandon this duty to military men in the field, and I don't think they've ever seriously considered that since the founding fathers uh, drafted our Constitution. I myself give close and continuing attention to maintaining the most effective uh, possible command and control over these uh, awesome weapons. I believe that the final responsibility for all decisions on nuclear weapons must rest with the civilian head of this government, the President of the United States. And uh, I think and reiterate that I believe that's the way the American people want it. President, President. President, in view of the opposition that your administration has shown in the past to uh, Mr. Shambay, how do you plan to deal with him now that he has returned and taken over control of the Congolese government? We are going to be as cooperative and as helpful as we can in the attempt to uh, see that uh, the people of that area have as uh, good a government as is possible, and we have every intention of uh, being understanding and cooperative. Mr. President, to go back to your meeting with Senator Goldwater, uh, do you and Senator Goldwater intend to enter into a pact to take the issue of civil rights out of the uh, campaign? Well, then, I would say to the architect of this uh, meeting this afternoon <laughs> that I do not believe that uh, any issue which is before the people can be eliminated from the campaign in a free society and election year. After all, that's the purpose of 
elections is to discuss the issues. And if candidates differ on important questions, it's up to the electors who must choose between them. And uh, in order to be able to uh, satisfactorily choose between them, uh, they must uh, hear their views. Now, I believe that all men and women are entitled to their full constitutional rights, regardless of their ancestry or their religion or the region of the country in which they may live. I believe that disputes, uh, no matter how bitter, should be settled in the courts, and not in the streets. And uh, uh, I made that statement many times to press conferences and speeches over the country in the last uh, several years. And that is uh, the reason that uh, after uh, um, more than two-thirds of the Democrats uh, uh, in the Congress uh, approved the Civil Rights Bill and some 80 percent of the Democrats and the uh, Republicans, 80 percent of the Republicans in the Senate supported the Civil Rights Bill that I signed the Civil Rights Bill. I believe that uh, all men and women are entitled to equal opportunities so that they can be judged according to their merits and uh, not according to some artificial barrier. Now, to the extent that Senator Goldwater differs from these views, uh, or the Republican Party differs, there will, of course, be discussion. Uh, and I intend to carry on some of it if I am a candidate. The test of a free society is that it discusses and resolves these uh, issues uh, intelligently and uh, doesn't sweep them under the rug when they become difficult. I propose to discuss and debate the hard and difficult er issues in the spirit of attempting to resolve them and on the assumption that the American people are willing to listen and are intelligent and are unafraid. No word or deed of mine that I'm aware of has ever or I hope will ever lend any aid or any comfort to this small minority who would take the law into their own hands for whatever cause or whatever excuse they may use. If Senator Goldwater and his advisors and his followers will follow the same course that I intend to follow and that I expect the Democratic Party to follow, which is a course of rebuffing and rebuking bigots and those who seek to excite and exploit tensions, then uh, it will be most welcome, and I think it will be a very fine contribution to our political life in America. Uh, to return to the trouble in Southeast Asia for a moment, can you hear me? Uh, to return to your statement three in your opening statement on Southeast Asia, do you and the Defense Department uh, foresee a possible withdrawal of our military wives and children from Saigon or other Southeast Asia command posts in the foreseeable future? No, we have no plans along that line. Over the past several years, I have heard rumors to that effect, I've seen uh, news stories uh, uh, making predictions along that line, but uh, uh, we have no plans at the present time for any such action. Uh, recently in San Francisco, some rather rough language was directed at you as being president uh, by the Republican opposition. I wondered if you felt this might be some sort of a signal as to a rather rough campaign for the presidency that's upcoming. Most campaigns are rough campaigns. Uh, I'm an old campaigner. I've been at it 30 years. And, uh, one of the first things I learned, at least as far as I'm concerned, uh, the people are not much interested in my personal opinion of my opponent. Your statement that the meeting with Senator Goldwater was to be unpublicized suggests that you're unhappy at the publicity about it. Was there any breach of faith by Senator Goldwater in announcing that he was going to meet you? Well, you've asked two questions there. First, there's no such suggestion at all. I'm not unhappy. hope I don't look unhappy. I don't feel unhappy. And uh, I don't know who suggested that to you. But uh, the question was raised that it was unpublicized. And knowing uh, the initiative and ingenuity of the American press, I didn't think it would be unpublicized very long. And I just suggested that that was rather difficult for... Uh, a fellow to take a glass of water at the White House or even go out to a hydrant and get a drink without it being adequately publicized. I can't even visit with my dogs without 
a lot of publicity, so I'm not unhappy about it at all. I just explained that uh, I thought it would be better to put it on the record, and so far as I know, uh, Senator Goldwater is perfectly happy with it. There's no breach of faith uh, on his part, and certainly none on my part. And, uh, I realize that uh, someone might indicate, because we suggestion in all of its entirety wasn't carried out, there might be some uh, difficulty between us, but uh, my uh, object in life has always been to not provoke fights, but to prevent them if possible. Mr. President. Mr. President. Uh, without regard to the Inter-American Conference now underway here, I take it you don't want to discuss the, the topic under negotiation. I wonder if you could tell us what your interpretation of the uh, viewpoint of the American people is on the Cuban problem and what should be done about it. I think that uh, their viewpoint is the same as the viewpoint of their government. I think that, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, that viewpoint is being considered by the uh, uh, foreign ministers who are meeting here now, I believe that uh, uh, we all recognize uh, the challenge to peace and freedom which exists and the necessity for not only being aware of that challenge but uh, attempting to uh, uh, combat it with uh, uh, every reasonable and wise means available. And I believe out of this, uh, out of this meeting, uh, the hemisphere will find a sound and effective answer, and I think that uh, there are some indications now that uh, the policies that we have pursued heretofore and the ones that we are suggesting be followed uh, now uh, are being effective. Uh, assuming you are not ready to name him yet, sir, could you describe for us your ideal running mate in terms of his <laughs> characteristics? attributes. The convention will meet at Atlantic City, select a candidate for president, nominate him, and uh, I assume uh, he will make his recommendations and then the delegates will act. And I think that uh, for me to make any uh, announcement at this time as to my personal preferences, uh, which, and I have none, I've made no decision to matter, uh, would be premature. Mr. President, President, Senator Goldwater has said that he will make an important issue out of what he views as increasing lawlessness and violence in the streets of our major cities. Are you willing to take this on as a campaign issue? Well, I'm against sin, I'm against lawlessness, and I'm very much opposed to violence, and I think we have to put a stop to it, and to the extent that we have the power to do so in the federal government, we are doing so. We're exerting every action we know to uh, keep uh, violence to a minimum. Uh, we do not have a national police force in this country, and we uh, have not assumed power that we do not have and we don't intend to. But uh, wherever there's violence, uh, we respond to it uh, within the limits of our power and our authority. Uh, we do have confidence in the local authorities. We do respect the sovereign states and the executives of those states. We have communicated with the mayors and with the governors and have made available to them all the facilities of the federal government to cooperate with them and work effectively with them. And we will continue to do so. And uh, we uh, deplore uh, uh, men taking the law into their own hands and men disregarding the law wherever it takes place. And we treat them all alike. And I don't think there's been doubt in anyone's mind in the United States that the President of the United States and the power of the Presidency and the people of the United States are going to do everything within their power and within their authority to stop violence wherever it appears. But our judgment is that uh, it's not up to us to in take over the authority of uh, uh, all the local governments and not, over, not uh, up to us to take over the authority of all the state governments. And I seem to have uh, uh, read and heard that other people too are opposed to the federal government to usurping the rights of the state. President. President. Sir, are there differences of opinion between uh, the United States and the South Vietnamese officials on the question of attacking North Vietnam? And if there are differences, what are they, please? Answer is no, and I stated it earlier, but I repeat it. Mr. 
President, President, how do you assess your opponent this November, Barry Goldwater, and do you anticipate a close race? I think that uh, what I think about Senator Goldwater and my uh, prediction as to outcome of the race is not very important. I think that's a matter for the American people to decide. I think what the people want to know is how I stand on issues and what my policies will be and what my party stands for. And they're much more interested in uh, what the uh, Democratic nominee advocates than what he thinks about his opponent or his chances of winning. I have every confidence that the Democratic Party will adopt a good platform, will select good candidates, that they will uh, present their views to the people without regard to personalities, and the people in their wisdom will make a good decision. Uh, about 10 days ago, Senator Goldwater used some very strong personal epithets to challenge your own sincerity of purpose in the civil rights issue. Now, would you sit down this afternoon to discuss civil rights without clearing that matter up first? Yes, yes, I uh, uh, am not concerned uh, with uh, Senator Goldwater's opinion of me. Uh, of course, I would like for it to be a good opinion, but if it's not, uh, that's a matter for him. He's entitled to his view, and uh, he has the right to express it if he thinks it's a uh, proper thing to do and wise thing to do, and the American people will make their judgments uh, of the various statements that he may make from time to time, and I'm perfectly willing to leave his opinion of me to the judgment of the people of this country. Mr. President, could you uh, give us your assessment of uh, the effect Governor Wallace's withdrawal from the presidential race will have? Uh, I have uh, been rather busily engaged the last few days, and I haven't uh, spent a great deal of time uh, uh, evaluating that situation. Uh, I don't know how much support uh, uh, Governor Wallace uh, had. Uh, I don't know how it would affect the uh, platforms and the nominees of the two parties. Uh, all I know is that he decided to uh, withdraw, and uh, I had heard and anticipated that he would do that, and he confirmed it. But what effect it'll have in November, I don't know. Mr. President, President, how active a campaign do you plan to conduct this fall? Whatever I think is wise and necessary, and I expect to appear in various parts of the country and uh, be very concerned with uh, seeing that uh, my party and my platform and the views of my candidates are uh, properly presented, and I'll make whatever contribution I uh, can, consistent with discharging uh, my other duties and try to be as helpful to take it as possible at all times. President, can you tell us if you plan any further action, any further federal action in New York City, and can you give us some elaboration of what you meant by extremist elements involved in the disorder? No, I uh, said that we get reports from there every evening. I don't think there's any question, but what the, there are some extremist elements involved and the violence take place there. I think that must be evident to everyone who reads the newspaper. Uh, and so far as we're concerned, we're prepared to take whatever action may be necessary and desirable. We have uh, Mr. Hoover keeping very close watch on it. He has an adequate uh, supply of manpower available to him. He has them assigned on specific investigations at the moment, and we'll follow it very closely and do whatever needs to be done. In uh, presenting your views this fall and uh, discussing the issues that uh, you want to present, would you be willing to debate <coughs> Senator Goldwater uh, on television? Well, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Mr. Mr. President, sir, there, ha there has been the claim in the campaign of an across-the-board attack on the foreign policy of the United States during recent years. This has raised questions here and abroad as to whether this wholesale kind of attack could cause your administration to trim its foreign policy in any major way. Question, sir? I think that foreign policy is an appropriate subject for our discussion. I think the people of this country uh, really need no advice from anyone else uh, in other parts of the world about the decision they should make, but I think they will certainly want to be sure that uh, 
uh, the foreign policy of their country is a proper one, and uh, I am prepared to present our, the views of my party uh, on that subject, and will do so at uh, such uh, time and such length uh, as uh, may be desirable. Sir, in response to an earlier question, you said that you hope neither candidate's words or deeds uh, would encourage extremists. Do you feel that anything Senator Goldwater has said of late would encourage extremists? Well, I'll leave that up to the judgment of the people and you. I don't want to be passing personal judgment on the acts of another individual. Uh, I have given you my viewpoint on it, and uh, that's a little mission you'll have to do for yourself. I think that uh, the American people uh, are perfectly capable of making their own decision with regard to the parties and the candidates, and I think that uh, they will do that without the necessity of advice from anyone abroad. Thank you, Mr. President.